Ospiti d'onore, signore e signori, buongiorno. Innanzitutto vorrei ringraziarvi per l'invito. Sono molto lieto di stare in questa bella regione Abruzzo, in Italy, my favorite European country. Avrei voluto continuare in italiano tutto il mio intervento, ma come vorrei che mi spiego bene, devo purtroppo cambiare in inglese. Spero che sia comprensibile. So, with its snow-covered mountains, Abruzzo reminds me of my own region in the north of Sweden called Jämtland. We are north and you are south, but we are increasingly connected in so many ways. As a matter of fact, the whole world is. But we also live in a time of growing divergence. Our international and European organizations, they have inclusive and sustainable growth as their motto. But in reality, we are floating apart. And that is a result of growing inequality within our countries. Sweden is no exception, but as we started from a very high level of equality, uh, we are better off than most other countries in the world today. I am not going to speak about happiness, but I'm going to speak about the importance of the society and of good governance for creating the best conditions, the good conditions for being to become happy. And we do live in a time of great contradictions. We know to a large extent what should be done, but we don't really possess the instruments to do it. And sometimes, not even the will. I have a favorite quotation from Charles Dickens, the famous British author who described the period from uh, uh, the French Revolution in a tale of two cities, one of his most read books. The two cities being London and Paris. I think this quotation catches the mood of our time. He started his book by writing, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. The inequalities in France led to the revolution of 1789. A somewhat later revolution, the Industrial Revolution, created new kinds of inequalities between the very richest and the poor, who flocked to the growing cities or toiled in the mines. Sweden was at that time one of the poorest countries in Europe, or maybe the poorest, and more than 25% emigrated to the uh, United States in the 19th century. Ignazio Silone, who introduced Abruzzo to many Swedes through his novels, described the similar conditions in Italy, reading his stories from the lives of the peasants in Fontamara is a reminder of the tremendous social transformation of Italy in the 20th century. The answer eventually was democracy and the development of the welfare state. Sweden was a latecomer to the process of industrialization, which is probably a great advantage for us, both economically and socially. The hardship that accompanied the transition from an uh, agricultural society to an in, industrial society never attained the proportions that were seen in other countries like in England or in Italy. Our popular movements and civil society, including the trade union movement, were strong and able to provide a solid foundation for uh, building the new Sweden. 
the famous Swedish model based on high taxes and good institutions were thus constructed from the beginning of the 19th century, no, 20th century and on, onwards. And now for the first time in history, uh, we human beings share or in practice the same world. Linked as we are by technology, trade, communications, culture and commercialism. But we do so on highly unequal terms. Globalization has led to decreasing poverty and greater similarities between countries, but also to imbalances between social and human needs on the one hand and global market forces on the other. Huge changes have taken place, and this during a short period of time. The epoch defined by industrial and collective forms of production has passed its peak. Today, the richest 80 people in the world, as many as could fit into one bus, have as much wealth as the poorest half of the world's population or 3.5 billion. And economic and technological opportunities continue to drive the increasing inequality. Around the world, 60 million people are displaced or in exile because of war. And many more have left their homes in search of a way to make a living. As Minister for Strategic Development, which is my correct title, within the Prime Minister's office. My work involves the developing the foundation for long-term thinking and new strategies for the Swedish government. And during my first year of work, we have focused on three areas. First, the green transition into a fossil-free welfare state. Second, jobs in the future, where new technology tends to replace people and possibly increase inequalities. And the third is the necessity to create better functioning global governance. Good governance is, the fun is fundamental on all levels, be it local, national, regional or global. I will soon come back to this and show some diagrams. Global governance is, I believe, our toughest challenge. A new and complex playing field for politics demands new ways of working together. In a world of low trust, we need to reconcile macroeconomic conditions with social needs. And there is a need to develop long-term ways to support job creation, growth, ecological sustainability and inclusive social development all at the same time. And it is possible, but you need to have the right political instruments and you need to have the right political cooperation. To address these issues, I have initiated three multi-stakeholder working groups with experts from government, business, academia and the civil society to present the recommendations to the government. This is an unorthodox way of working in politics, at least in Sweden. We will prioritize, uh, uh, and as we now embark on stage two in my, my work, we will prioritize two things. We will first of all, we'll connect our analysis to the new UN agenda, the new 2030 agenda decided upon in September last year, which captures the full field of important goals to attain ecological, social and economic sustainability. And second, <clears throat> we will integrate our work more closely with the processes within the government office as a whole. After all, it is the responsible ministers who should take the proposals further and turn them into political action, practical political action. Get some water here. Uh, can you help me? Thank you. Uh, my role is to apply a holistic and long-term view on politics 
and capture the issues that tend to fall between uh, portfolios or between chairs. If you focus on achieving results, you will find that a great number of ministers must be involved in solving one single problem. Be it on unemployment, migration integration, or environmental degradation. All three types of sustainable development are interconnected. Social, economic, ecological. If one is left out, the others cannot work. The world is in a process of complete transformation. The great economic disparities that have arisen in more or less all countries, worst in some emerging economies and in the United States, threaten to have a paralyzing effect on economic and social development in Europe and in the world. High levels of unemployment and too low investments in competence and education will in the long run be very costly for our societies. And it's not only radical economists who make this claim. Institutions like OECD and IMF, International Monetary Fund, are also raising the alarm. Christine Lagarde, director of IMF, recently said that if you want to see more durable growth, you need to generate more equitable growth. And reducing inequalities is one of the goals that make up the 2030 agenda. And EU must face this crucial challenge. The discussions about establishing a European, European pillar of social rights is a step in this direction and more investments in accordance with the European Fund for Strategic Investments is another step, important step for us all. Although Sweden has strong growth and strong employment growth for the time being, we are very dependent on the growth and the development of Europe as a whole. It is the best of times and it is the worst of times. A new world of work is emerging driven by digitalization, artificial intelligence, outsourcing, and robotization. The global market economy has left our national political institutions behind a long time ago. Skills, reforms, and renewal are key words whose implementation demands collaboration between all stakeholders in the society, as well as improved governance in the public sector. I am hopeful about Sweden and the Nordic countries. And the reason is that we score very high in three very important concepts for good governance. And I will show you some diagrams that will uh, indicate this. The three concepts that I'm thinking of is uh, our institutions, trust, and uh, innovation. And this is the first picture that shows you that uh, the Nordic countries probably are the best government governed in the world. That is according to the economists. And uh, what they are measuring is, as you can see, global competitiveness, ease of doing business, global innovation, corruption, human development, and prosperity. So altogether we score the four highest. Iceland fifth Nordic countries, a little bit further down. Uh, and, uh, but of course, this is something that we have to fight for all the time. It depends on very much well-functioning institutions and public systems, including an efficient tax authority and acceptance among people to pay their taxes. This, as you can see, we have high taxes. Denmark, the highest. Sweden and Finland pretty high as well. And uh, because of these high taxes, you are able to construct a good social security system, equal rights and opportunities for women, and much, much more, which is reflected in the size of the public sector. Here you can see the size of uh, the public sector. I don't know if you can read the names of the, uh, the, the countries, but um, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden among the five 
for the biggest uh, public sector. Luxembourg has the biggest, is the biggest. And this is also the condition for a high female participation in the labor market. Almost as many women as men work in Sweden, and our empl employment rate is close to 80%. The average in the European Union is 69%, and Italy is close to 60%. If you change this, public debt will decrease. And um, it's important, of course, for the individual and for, for growth, both for the state and for the individual at the same time. The second key factor after institutions and social systems is the high level of trust among people. That's gender equality, where you see that the five Nordic countries are in the top. Uh, and um, this is trust in others. This is so-called generalized trust, if you trust foreigners. People are asked on the street. And uh, as you see, the four Nordic, big Nordic countries, they are uh, highest when it comes to trust. And this goes also for trust in institutions. We trust institutions. And one reason is, of course, that we have non-corrupt institutions, generally speaking. They are not corrupt. And people have trust in the system, the social system, or the, in, in the government. This is also a relationship between competitiveness and institutions. So it, it, there is a correlation, as it seems, between trust in institutions, which is measured uh, on one part of the diagram, and then competitiveness on the other. And there is an obvious correlation between the two competitiveness and trust in institutions. So it, it pays to have good institutions. And of course, part of this is low levels of corruption. I know that transparency is part of the, the board in Oscar Pomilio, which makes me happy to know. And the, the last factor, the last third factor, is innovation. You have to have high level of innovation to be successful in the econo in economic development. And your competitiveness is dependent on your innovation, the rate of innovation. And we score high there. Sweden used to be second, now we are third. Well, that is, of course. And all this is something that you have to fight for all the times to keep, to create a new. If not, they will ge generate, degenerate with time. I mean, even if the nation state has good governance, it doesn't have any longer all the answers. Because we live in this interconnected world. The conditions for international uh, cooperation is also changing fundamentally due to geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, uh, shifts. And in the worst case, this intervening period that we are in could carry on for quite some time and be dominated by crisis and conflicts. Inequality, unemployment, and I believe a globalized world are breeding grounds for populism and xenophobia. In the old industrialized countries, a reaction has set in. People are looking backwards and wanting to recreate what used to be nationalism and the old days, the ways of doing things in the old days. We all have these kind of parties now. And they attack internationalism and they attack regional corporations such as European Union. And this reaction is futile and dangerous and risks seriously delaying democratic and social development. Ignorance is part of the problem that should be addressed by us politicians and civil society together. The European project is facing major challenges. They stem from many different but coinciding problems and threats. The ongoing economic crisis in the wake of the great financial crisis from 2008 is one 
and Europe's inability to cope with migration is another. And the growth of nationalist and right-wing populist parties is a third, just to mention a few. The new policy agenda for the European Union presented by the Italian government last month underlines the need to make EU part of the solution and not the problem. It calls for seizing the opportunity of a big European project. The austerity policies have resulted in two low levels of demand and investment that delay economic recovery. At the same time, we face enormous investment needs for the green transition. If we are to succeed in staying as far below two degree limit for global warming as possible, in accordance with the Paris Agreement. The um, ongoing changes require a major political response from leaders of society in all fields, political, economic and social, cultural. Not just now, but for many years to come. The 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement concluded last year both have the potential to stand out as important milestones on the way to more sustainable models for our societies. Not because the agreements themselves uh, contain um, commitments that will save humanity from disasters, but because they are strong signals of the direction in which our world is heading, which in itself will trigger action. For a long time, shared responsibility and solidarity have lost out in the age of neoliberalism. But no society can exist without solidarity. Everyone understands this. <laughs> I believe that this is something that everybody understands but it's the forms and the reach of solidarity that all politics is about. And common people have to be mobilized for the change. This is particularly important in a time when characters like Donald Trump can be chosen as candidate for the most influential political office in the world. People need to be seen and respected. And in a democracy, it is absolutely fundamental that they understand the time they live in. There are glimmers of light. One is the growing interest taken by the business community and the financial sector in the movement towards a sustainable world. And I believe I could look at Oscar Bomilio as one expression of this. <laughs> we see. We see this also very clearly in the transition to climate sustainability. Environmental thinking in general, even social issues, are no longer a matter of isolated CSR initiatives. They represent a new way of thinking based on the combined insight of what the world needs and the fact that there are large profitable markets out there, growing markets. The strong interest from both business representatives and the civil society in the 2030 agenda also sends an important signal about partnership. A world that is not sustainable is not in the interest of business either. A change in society towards solidarity does not happen overnight. It requires determined political efforts to build up new forms of cooperation that better match our current reality. We need a more social economy, and we need the mobilization of people. We need cooperation between nations of the world and between sectors and different interests. The Swedish Prime Minister, Mr. Stefan Löfven, who met your Prime Minister a few weeks ago, has taken the initiative to introduce the concept of a global deal, international tripartite cooperation, in support of more and decent jobs 
and fairer distribution of the fruits of globalization. And this need to go hand in hand with a great green transition in the world. Government resources will be nowhere near enough. The private financial markets must begin to serve the interests of society. This might sound a bit visionary, but it isn't. Things are happening out there. G20 did take the initiative to start a green finance working group. And there is also a working group for climate finance within G20. But to succeed both in Europe and globally, our European cooperation must be reinvigorated. A divided and weak Europe can neither deliver jobs and good lives for people, nor global governance. I welcome Prime Minister Renzi's initiative, a shared European policy strategy for growth, jobs and stability. It is a constructive contribution to this debate. And I can assure you that my government, the Swedish government, will actively participate in European and international processes for an inclusive and sustainable world. And in doing so, it will be necessary to build alliances with other governance, governments. And why not with Italy and Sweden? We have had some contacts over the last few months that would indicate that this could very well work fine for us. Our transition towards a sustainable world must be built by a new spirit of solidarity and cooperation. And as President Kennedy once said, and this will be my, 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 my final words, change is the law of life. And those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Thank you for listening.